Hello and welcome to Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast, a podcast to inspire you about outdoor travel and activities in the UK and across the world. I'm Hannah and you can email me with your thoughts or questions on live at cicerone.co.uk. Today we're going to be talking about the Trekking in the Van Wars guidebook, which principally includes the Tour of the Van Wars and the Tour de Glacier de la Van Wars. Someone who knows much more about the Van Wars than I do, which granted isn't difficult, is Leslie Williams, who has visited the Van Wars many, many times and also helped Jonathan with his recent reworking and rewalking of Kev Reynolds' Trekking in the Van Wars guidebook. Hi, Leslie. Hello. So, Leslie, first of all, where is the Van Wars? Well, the Van Wa National Park is south of the, the much more well-known French Alps area of Chamonix. It lies sort of due south. To get there is quite easy. The, the main point of access is a major town called Modan, which lies in a valley just to the south of the Van Wa National Park and is served by a good road network and railway links. Kev calls the Van Wars a trekker's delight and says it should be better known than it is. Uh, would you agree with that? Oh, certainly. It's, it's a fantastic area. There are many, many mountain huts dotted around in the region, which means that it's ideal for people who perhaps don't want to walk very far in any one day, or more able walkers can walk between two or three mountain refuges to make a longer day route. It's well served with a number of very good paths as well. The main GR5 and GR55 either go through or around the edge of the national park. And then there are many very good other routes within the area. Uh, so it really is a trekker's delight. You can create a more challenging or fairly straightforward route. We, on one occasion when we've been in the area, we actually met a family where they had a nine-year-old daughter and they were doing the tour of the Vanoir and the nine-year-old daughter was managing very well. Brilliant. So, so it's suitable for all sorts of walkers. It would make a really good first alpine trek route, but it's equally well suited to very experienced alpine trekkers because there are some much more challenging routes that you can take, which go higher and go over more difficult passes as well. So it really is something for everybody. And the, the scenery is absolutely fantastic. The, the glaciers are the sort of furthest south in France, but they're still there and you can still see them. They're not huge, but they're definitely there still. <laughs> yeah, the, the photography in the book is absolutely beautiful. I think, you know, no disrespect to Kev, but I think you can really tell that the photographs have been updated and they, they are stunning. Yeah, we were mainly lucky with good weather when we were doing most of the, the research for the book. But we did actually have one or two really, really stormy days in as much as we weren't actually able to go over one of the passes. There were another couple of groups of people who set out to do one particular pass that we decided that perhaps we shouldn't attempt in under those conditions. And they had to turn back, we later found out as well. I mean, you really can get all kinds of weather in the Alps. And this was a, a very nasty, snowy, stormy day or two. <laughs> so what time of the year did you go? And was that the best time of the year to go? Um, well, the best time of the year, loosely speaking, for, for any alpine trekking is between around the mid to end of June when the huts open and around about mid-September when they start to close. So outside of those times, it's not particularly easy to sort out a route. Although with the Tour of the Van Wa, you could certainly do a number of stages using sort of village accommodation instead. But by and large, it, it's really just between mid-June and mid-September. I mean, it looks like it would be such a shame to miss out on the huts because, again, from the pictures, the huts look like such a charming part of doing any of those treks. They just, they look marvellous. Yeah, they're incredibly varied, actually. There's one that we stayed in, which is quite modern, built partly into the hillside with a grass roof and all sorts of ecological features. And then conversely, there, there are incredibly basic little huts, which are very, very rudimentary in terms of the facilities. Um, Refuge de la Lys consists of three little wooden huts. One is for the people staying there to sleep in, and there isn't anything else in there except bunks. 
One is for The Guardian, which also includes the cooking facilities. And then the third one is a sort of general living room come, dining room come, there is a cold water tap and a sink room. And then the only other washing facilities are a sort of sink outside where you can have a a very quick cold wash (laughs) if you want to. (laughs) I can imagine that is quite refreshing. Uh, Yeah, it is. And then everything (laughs) in between. One of the best meals that we had was actually in a, a little tour of the Western Vanoir that we did where there was an even smaller hut where the Guardian slept upstairs There was a tiny kitchen about the size of a cupboard. And then the rest of the hut was two layers of bench for sleeping on and some tables. And this lady produced the best, tastiest meal that we'd had of the whole circuit in this minute hut. Yeah, You didn't want to drink too much that night, though, because you'd had to go out and go round the back of the hut in the dark and try and find the loo. (laughs) (laughs) It's hard to know whether the food that you eat on these things is actually good or if you just had a really challenging day and it tasted like the best meal you've ever had. Yeah, but generally speaking, being France, they give you pretty good food. Possibly not quite as much as the Italian huts. Um, The Italians will go to town giving you a a whole pasta meal and then another meal, (laughs) effectively. The guidebook mainly covers the Tour de Vanoise and the Tour de Glacier. Can you tell us a little bit about each of those and why they're different? Yes. Well, the the Tour of the Vanoir, in terms of its normal route, is about 165 kilometres and it circumnavigates both the eastern and western side of the Vanoir. So the likelihood is that you would start either around Tine or the Van Val d'Isere, um, where you have rail access and road access if you needed it, or um, more likely you'd start at Modane and have your first night up at the Refuge de Logère, which is a sort of a cross between a, a mountain hut and a sort of mountain hotel come restaurant. It has rooms as well as dormitories and things. From there, you can stage it as difficult or, or, or rather the, the stages being as long or as short as you reasonably can. Each refuge is roughly three or four hours away from the next one. So you can have a long day or you can have some short days and vary it according to what you want to do and the weather and everything else. So the convention is usually to do it in a sort of anti-clockwise direction. So you go around and work your way up above the valley and you reach a a little village called Bonneval-sur-Arc, which is at the base of the Isaran Pass, which is the highest point that you go over. You go over the Isaran and down to the Val Val d'Isere, then round to Tine or just above Tine if you follow the, the ridge route. And then you come round to an area where a number of different paths all sort of join and then continue towards Pralognon. And then finally from Pralognon back to Modane, effectively. So that's a sort of big circuit. Um, then the Tour de Glacier de la Vanoir is a circuit of the the sort of western chunk of the national park where the glaciers are, as the name suggests. And that involves one or two higher coals to go over. Um, So it's a little bit more technical. It's not as long. Um, It's probably only about 75 kilometres in total, but a little more challenging. So the Tour of the Vanoir takes around about 10 or 11 days and is 163 kilometres long. The Tour des Glaciers de la Vanoir will probably take about five days and is 72 kilometres. But yeah, each of those days involves quite a lot more ascent and descent. Yeah, so shorter but tougher. Yeah. Would you would you still say that the Tour de Glacier was suitable for a, a first time alpine trek, or is that a bit more advanced? It's probably a bit more advanced. Um, there are some sort of fairly tough days. Yeah, it's probably not ideal for the first trek. So you could maybe do the Tour de Vanoise and then potentially move on to the Tour de Glacier next time. Yes, I would have yeah. thought so, yeah. What other trekking routes would be a good preparation for the Tour de Glacier? 
possibly some of the treks in the Dolomites, just to be sure that you're happy with a level of exposure, steep ground. Um, the days on the Tour de Glacier are mostly fairly. So there are two days that are sort of 20 kilometres, which are in mountain environment is actually quite quite a long distance. Um, so certainly practising on that sort of terrain and walking for that sort of distance. I remember being really surprised when I did my first trek at how short the days had been when in terms of actual kilometres covered. <laughs> because they, <laughs> cause we were out there all day and then we would have done 13 kilometres or something. And you think, but hang on, that's taken us six hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of it is to do with how much up and down there is. <laughs> Yeah. So the area of the Van Mars is specifically known for its wildflowers. Yes. Um, the, the flowers in the early summer are probably the most spectacular. You get fantastic hillsides just rammed full of different flowers. So you're talking about sort of the end of June, early July. And you you have wildflowers, you have alpine rose, you have everything seems to blossom all at once. And it really is quite spectacular. But then that's not to say that there aren't flowers for the rest of the year. They're just different ones and they're at different stages of their growth and everything. But the early summer is definitely the best for that. But it's also because it's a national park, it's actually a, a sort of nature reserve. So your chances of seeing ibex and chamois and all sorts of other mountain, uh, you know, the ubiquitous marmot and all sorts of other mountain wildlife is also pretty high. There are one or two pictures of ibex in the book and there's an ibex that we were very, very close to and it just stood there watching us. <laughs> Did you use Gillian's Alpine Flowers little mini guide to help you? Well, yeah. I mean, it was really useful because there were just so many flowers and it's somehow much more interesting to be able to identify what they are. Uh, and you get lovely little sort of natural rock gardens with lots of different flowers growing there, as well as the whole fields and meadows full of flowers. I suppose it's the sort of thing where you might take photographs of each flower and then sit over dinner and, and look them up rather than pausing every couple of seconds to look them up whilst you're out there walking. Yeah, that's that's the best bet. And you, you, you do start building up the names of one or two of them, at least anyway. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I've been um, fungi hunting quite a lot recently. And uh, I, I take loads of pictures and then try and identify them at the end of the day. But it's not always yeah. possible. But Gillian hasn't done a mushroom book. <laughs> Maybe that could she be should. the next project. <laughs> so what would you say your favourite stage of the whole guidebook was? Um, I think one of my favourite bits is actually weirdly between Pralognon and just above Modane at uh, a refuge called Refuge de Logère. It, it basically consists of a long north to south walk up through a long valley and over a high col and then down to this refuge of the Lorger. And it's it's just spectacular. You've got mountains on both sides with snow on them uh, and it feels like a real journey as well. I kind of imagine there aren't any bad bits. Like, there might be more tiring days and, you know, more more hilly days, but it, it looks like a, a pretty decent place to go walking anyway. Yeah, the, there aren't any bad bits. Um, the, there are more difficult bits, there are easier bits. And if it snows, then it can be quite challenging. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's all great. I mean, it, the, the tour of the Vanoir actually goes through Val d'Isère, which most people will think of as being just a big ski resort. And it doesn't really detract from the, the overall tour because you don't tend to see any of the ski lifts and things like that when you go through the Val d'Isère. Um, it is a big built up overgrown village, but there's plenty of accommodation because of that. But the whole tour of both the, the glacier and the tour of the Vanoir, they actually avoid all the ski areas. Um, they are centred more to the west of the National Park. So you don't see endless lifts and things like that. If you want to go somewhere, you have to walk. <laughs> and presumably, if you're going sort of mid-June to September time, it's not going to snow unless you're really high up. Is that correct? Um, it can snow at any time. I mean, it literally right. can snow at any time. 
Um, it's less likely to snow during the summer, obviously, but we've been there when it snowed when we were actually doing the GR5 and that was quite tricky and again when we were doing the research it, there was a big storm that I mentioned earlier that prevented us going over a high pass so if you've got a high pass coming up and it snows then you you may have problems otherwise walking poles and boots and just being careful will tend to be fine. So you wouldn't necessarily take crampons no, no. Okay, you just just wait it out in a hut if you needed to. Wait it, wait it out in a hut or whatever. It's it's the sort of area where you can think of other options. And do you need to take any ropes or anything like that? No, not if you're doing a trek. You need a good head for heights for one or two of the alternative routes and some level of experience, but you don't need a rope. Cool. Um, I know there's someone on the Cicerone Connect group who... If it says you need a good head for heights or anything like that, he just knows that that is not him. He's, <laughs> he's asked us to produce a guidebook that is, I can't remember what he called it, something like mountain walks for softies, where there's no big, like, steep look down. Drops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, there are one or two passes in the Van Moir that are quite steep. And you think, yeah, I'm just going to go for it for this last 50 metres and not look down. <laughs> But there again, I'm not very good on really steep ground. I'm less good going steep down from a pass. I hate that. I just sort of mutter darkly in my head to myself. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, down is always worse than up, I think. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. And just as slow as well. Yes. <laughs> Well, I did I did notice the word undulating creeps oh, into this guidebook, and that is a particular bugbear of mine, is that word, because undulating, depending on who uses it, really can mean I mean, I would I would think a couple of gentle little bumps for undulations, but here it's not going to be a couple of gentle little bumps, it's going to be actual alps. Yeah. Um, I mean in any one stage, there's probably only two or three stages that are strictly speaking undulating, I would have said on the Vanwa. <laughs> <laughs> in that uh, between Refuge Plan Sec, which is pretty much your sort of first stop through to Refuge uh, La Ponte, that's undulating. It, it's by and large uh, a kind of balcony route, but because it's a balcony route, it's going to bumble up and down quite a bit. And then from our pont to Entre de Zoo, again, is undulating for quite a bit before it then drops down right at the end to, to the Entre de Zoo. But the rest of the stages tend to be much more sort of you're going up over a pass and down or descending and along or something like that. I've never heard the term balcony route, but does that mean it's going halfway, it's traversing kind of halfway up the mountain? Yeah, a balcony route it will tend to be sort of above above a valley and you're traversing, but you may not necessarily be exactly following a contour because of whatever's going on on the side of that mountain. So there might be an area that's much more sort of rocky and cliffs and things like that where you, the path will either climb up over it and down or underneath it. And then you've got kind of side valleys coming in. So the path will zigzag in and out as well. So you'll get ups and downs and zigzags all over the place. But, but the but idea I'll, that you, you don't go into each valley and climb up and over each thing. No, it'll it'll be following the side of a big valley with smaller little valleys dissecting the hillside, but by and large staying roughly the same sort of height, but then undulating. <laughs> <laughs> there she goes again. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, well, with thoughts of undulations, I think that's a really good whistle-stop tour of the Van Wars. So thank you, Leslie, for that. Thank you. Brilliant. And thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the latest episode of Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast. I'd love to know what you think or if there's anything you'd like us to cover in future episodes. Please email live at cicerone.co.uk or leave a review on your podcast platform. You can follow or subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss new episodes, or you can sign up to our newsletter for all our latest news, events, and guidebooks. Visit cicerone.co.uk for further details. We'll be back soon, but please come and join us on our social channels. We're on all the main ones as Cicerone Press, and we also have a Facebook group, Cicerone Connect, where you can meet and chat to other outdoor enthusiasts. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you soon.